Good evening, and welcome to the U Talk Show, where I like to break into song. Kyle likes to surprise me by switching into Latin and using phrases that I'm pretty sure I have beaten into his head with a hammer by this point. We pontificate on the nature of the world, and where tonight, Kyle has something he'd like to tell you all. The Australian dream is dead, and corporate greed killed it. You fucked. Thank you for coming to my tech talk. So I recall <laughs> reading about some of the remarks that I uh, think it was Menzies made um, regarding classes of the citizenry, those who contributed to society and those who exploited society. Um here he used the uh the favored Forgotten moniker people. of lifters and leaners hmm? he, uh, used okay, mon- yeah, he used the moniker of lifters and leaners which was from an american poet as i understand and it was sort of widely circulated in australia at the time and we've seen a return to form in that sort of dichotomy with some of the statements made by our very own scomo who we will never allow you to forget, famously shat himself at Nangadine Mackers. Um, but Menzies also noted that there is always going to be a group in society who are prevented from participating in society to the full extent that we would expect, and that those people must be supported to live a life with dignity. In many respects, he set up the concept of a a state that provided for the welfare of its most vulnerable, and in the very same speeches, set up the rhetoric which would be used to dismantle the social security networks on which those vulnerable people depended. Um, Certainly, if you're a person who is at the tender ministrations of Centrelink, uh, the Australian dream may as well be dead for you. Let's be entirely honest. It's far too profitable to keep you depressed, to point you in the direction of job search providers who'll sign you up for programs and courses and funnel you into positions where you're getting subsidized for being employed and then they'll boot you out once you're no longer convenient. <clears throat> That's just on my end of things. Like our parents, our parents might have had the dream of, you know, white picket fence, a few kids, a nice house. What have we Water got? Block. Maybe maybe one day we won't live in a share house. If you're willing to move out to the country. I mean, hey, I did it, and it's kind of nice out here. I moved out a little less far than you, and uh, the rents are still increasing because they can. Um, and the problem is that, you know, we're seeing people who are who would potentially otherwise be able to enter the job market trying to move further out so that they can afford the rents. The jobs aren't there for them, and the commute will kill them. And so we say, oh, you know, they should have just thought about that. And it's like... No, no, you chuckle fucks. You, you've, you've, you've destroyed the social contract. You have eroded away the rights of workers. You have sold every piece of infrastructure that wasn't bolted down, and ninety nine point nine percent of the pieces that were failed to invest in the development of your country, your states, your cities, your urban centers, and you are blaming people who just got born into this and are trying to deal with the mess you left. Yeah. I mean, a great way I think of describing it would be that they, they tore apart society so that their donors could feed on its carcass. Yeah. But do you know what the difference is between most like uh, carcass feeders and the ultra rich? Carcass feeders form a useful part of the ecosystem. They clean up trash. They control vermin. They're the garbage men of nature. The ultra-rich, they are the vermin. They have no control mechanism. They strip the flesh from society. They remove its muscle and its connective tissue. 
and then they shit all over the rest of us. I think it's worth pointing out that we're not talking about people who have made it decently wealthy and might have a million dollars tied up in their business. No, oh Christ, if you have a million dollars, you're basically what's left of the middle class at this point. Yeah. Hell, if you have if you have a freestanding home that is not like an apartment or townhouse, which through the wall is the next home, that that puts you in what's left of the middle class. And even those people probably don't feel right now like they're in the middle class. And the it's middle class get is already hell. dead as well. Yeah. And it's going to get a hell of a lot worse for everyone if slash when the economy crashes. I still think it's going to crash. In How fact, I'm surprised it's not crashing right now. my internet now. connection? <laughs> You're not. Ugh. Well, not unless you want to move out far into the country. My internet connection is kind of the way I get my work done, so that's going to be a problem. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, that's kind of interesting how internet is needed these days for basically everything. How much of a change there's been in society in the last 30 years in that regard. But that is a story, or rather an episode, for another time. I'm pretty sure we've already tackled the NBN and what it was meant to achieve and what it failed to achieve and the reasons that it didn't do what it was meant to do. Give you a hint. It's corruption. You know, it used to be that every time we could prove that corruption was making the lives of the everyday person worse, I almost got a semi, you know? I, I, I used to I was going to like say, it was, I thought you were about to say it was almost could notable. Get like was... Seeing that there is this one simple problem that we can we can theoretically tackle and make so many things better. And now, every time I have to say that corruption has fucked us over, there's this little piece of me that dies inside. <sighs> I would say welcome to my world, but I think you've been a part of it for a while now. The French have a really good solution for this problem, or at least they did up until the 1970s. Oh, for a second there, I thought you were going to say the 17, uh, 1700s. Nope, the last execution by guillotine was in the 1970s. Oh, okay, you are going there. <laughs> I thought you were making a joke. Uh... Jefferson wrote, The tree of liberty must occasionally be replenished with the blood of patriots and tyrants. What he was referring to was the need to ensure that the people could hold the government accountable by the by the force of arms if necessary. Um, it's no small wonder that the French were one of the staunch allies of the United States in the early days. The French understood the need for getting the people who were damaging society and disposing of them in an environmentally friendly and sustainable manner. And simultaneously sounding a warning to the rest that if you unjustly enrich yourself, if you derelict your duty in order to make it big, that you are still just as mortal as everyone else. Of course, murder is a horribly uncivilized way to solve problems. But I do sometimes wish that some of the people who benefit from sowing disunity and fear in our society understood that that they bleed as red as I do. Well, perhaps we'll just have to be satisfied with making them bleed green. Is what I would say if we lived in the US. I mean, money over here is rainbow. You know, if you think about it, it's got every. Yeah, color. but $100 bills are still green. If we just make That's $100 true. bills spill out of them. <laughs> you know what? I stand corrected. And we will just make them bleed green. 
or make them bleed green and gold. Australians, oh, let us rejoice, for, for we, we are young and very fucked. <laughs> all right, well, we've reached time, so uh, we'll catch you all later. Thanks for watching. Not y'all.